The former president of the Senate, Bukola Saraki, declares his intention to run for president in 2023. However, is he up to the task? And of course, we will be discussing the various challenges faced by the Akiti State chapter of the All Progressive Congress in its recently concluded primaries. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anna Kobe. The former president of the Senate, Bukola Saraki, recently declared his intention to run for president in 2023 on the ticket of the People's Democratic Party, PDP. Saraki vowed to ensure that all Nigerians have a greater sense of what it means to be Nigerian if allowed to rule the country. This is, however, not the first time he is declaring his interest to compete for the presidential seat, as he had expressed similar intentions in 2019. While speaking on the challenges he faced when he was president of the 8th Assembly, he said the National Assembly under him did not curry favor from the executive because he stood for the independence of the National Assembly. Well, joining us is Ilemona Onoja. He is the special assistant to Dr. Bukola Saraki, and he joins us now. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Nodja. Thank you very much for having me. Great. So let's start with, I mean, we already in the opening, I have said that he's not a newcomer to, you know, this um, contest. But then, of course, everybody would ask as a first question, why does your principal want to be president? Um, I think that's a very straightforward answer. He wants to become president because he has the um, the, the requirements, the contents, the character, the capacity to help Nigerians and Nigeria develop a Nigeria of our dreams, the sort of Nigeria that we all want for, we all wish for. It's, I, I think it's very straightforward. Over the years, over the course of a very glowing political career that spanned about 20 years, he's developed the sort of advisory, um, executive, legislative, and then head of legislative ex, um, experience that helps give him a worldview, that gives him an adequate understanding of how, of, of, of the many challenges our, our country faces, how to um, overcome these challenges, where the... Mr. Nodja, are you still there? Can you hear me? Okay, we lost you for a second. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so, it, it, you know, it, it, he has the sort of experience that, that helps him know you know how to overcome the challenges that face our country where to get the resources to overcome these challenges are how to um the legislative framework that is required the implementation that is required to give impetus to that legislative framework uh, and so on so it's a question of competence and capacity and he has demonstrated over the course of his career, both in the public and the private sector, that he has that competence and that capacity. So, of course. Now, um, I've spoken to many people who have, uh, in time past, said they wanted to be president of this country. And Nigeria is a very unique country. And, of course, that is because of the many problems that we have, the fact that we are diverse people and we have different problems, especially in 2021, why would anybody want to be the president of Nigeria? It, it's a daunting task, if you ask me. But then every single person you talk to who wants to be president says, oh, I want to change the fortunes of Nigerians. And in, 20, in 2015, we, we saw a lot of people throw their hats in the ring and say, we want to be president, we want to change the future and the fortunes of Nigeria. But here we are, I mean, almost seven, seven plus years down the line, that has not been the case. What exactly is he going to do differently that should make anybody even look in his direction? Um, that's a really impressive question. Uh, the first thing that makes me, and sometimes, you know, the one, a lot of people in my generation think that question. I mean, why would anybody want to be president? There's the, sometimes the belief that Nigeria is a hopeless case and that um, things will not change. But the reality is that Nigeria is not a hopeless case. Nigeria can change. What Nigeria requires to change is people who have a clarity of vision, who have 
competence of um, competence of ability who have content of character to apply themselves to build the systems that we require to change Nigeria. Um, over the years, I agree with you that we hear that a lot. And we heard that a lot in 2015 from people who came and, well, changed the promises that they made to change. But that said, we, we have to apply ourselves. We don't have another country. We, we, we don't have where else to go. While, a lot, well, while some people may think that they can relocate and everything, the, the bulk of us don't have where else to go. What that does is that it leaves us with an obligation to stay behind and to change the car um, and to change our country for the better. It is an objective to which we must remain committed, no matter what the situation or the circumstances are. Having said that, what does he think he'll do differently? Well, different from everything that's happened in the last seven years. One, stand up for the Nigerian people, which he did during his tenure as president of the Senate, to stand up for the Nigerian people. And he would tell people, um, and he, 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 he would show, you know, strength and skill, capacity. Two, he will be very open, he'll be transparent. Three, he'll be committed, he'll be empathetic. Four, he'll be a bridge between the young and the old. Five, he'll be a bridge between the north and the south, bringing all our people back together, rather than being a divisive figure. Six, he will be um, a bridge between conservatism and liberalism to ensure that all our people are protected. We have an application of both worlds. You seven, oh my God, he's a competent person in the economy. Our economy needs a critical overhaul. There's a lot of things that he would do differently particularly different from the last seven years that we have seen that have been characterized by pain and suffering and sorrow. No, that's not the way we're going to go, Dr. Bukala Saraki. And those of us in this team have been putting together plans to ensure that we take power back to where it belongs with the Nigerian people. We put our hands to work. We put our young people to work. We protect our old people. We make our farms and our industries productive. We protect we rebuild value in our currency. We ensure productivity of our people. We, you know, we, we, we take into consideration the character of our people, the creativity of our people, and we seek to apply that creativity and that character. There's a lot that we intend to do differently. And I believe that over the course of the campaign period, we'll be communicating with Nigerian people, you know, very well detailed plans of what the intentions are, where the money will come to fund those intentions and the effects it will have on the lives of everyday Nigerians. Interesting. You talk about a Nigerian um, or your principle as someone who is going to build, be a build bridge, uh, a, a build a bridge builder. I beg your pardon, tongue twister. Um, yes, it, it's interesting that you said that. Now the country is at a point where the South is pushing for a Southern presidential ticket. Um, the Southern governors had said that. People in the South should not vote for anybody who is not from the South. They should not, in other words, don't vote for anybody for coming from the Northern region. And then, of course, it brings that issue of zoning into question. I'm, I'm going to get to the point where I ask you where you stand on that and where your principal stands on it, knowing that he's also representing the North. But this is a conversation that is ongoing. Um, where does your principal stand on it? And then where do you stand on it, being that? A lot of people, including the elder statesman, um, Clack, who has also said, look, step down and let Southerners run for this ticket. I think that your opinion is, do we want a president, a Niger, a, do we want a Southern president or do we want a Nigerian president? I think that's the president. Are you implying president. that a Southern president is not a Nigerian president? No, but the... I'm not implying that. That's not what I'm, I'm implying. What I'm implying is that making the origins of, of the president the primary consideration, as opposed to competence and character and ability, it, it makes me wonder. We have done things differently. We've done things in a particular way for so long. It, it hasn't always worked for us, has it? The question is, here now, facing an existential crisis with two wars, right, in the two wars against terror, one in the northwest, one in the northeast, and, and a, a practical invasion of the north-central part of the country by, armed, by an armed militia, an agitation for um, secession in the southeast, 
an agitation for secession in the Southwest, for self-actualization, as you will so call it. That's an existential crisis. Really, is, is our focus on the origin of who our next president should be? We have the worst unemployment rates in our country's history at 33%. We have food inflation at more than 20%. Really? Origins of our president is what the focus should be? We have underemployment at, at, at astronomical levels. We have youth unemployment at topping 50%. Our farms are unsafe. We have a failing healthcare system. Really, is that? I, I don't know that zoning is the is the is the fundamental that we should be looking at in what our next president should be. I, I don't know that it is. I, I, I'm speaking for myself now as a Nigerian citizen, as I have a right to. That I don't think that it should be. I know that my my, my principal has spoken at fora where he says that zoning is a consideration, but it cannot be the only consideration. And I agree. Now, if we're going to speak about this zoning, people speak about this thing and talk about equity and justice. But where is the justice and the equity in this argument? And I'll make the argument. In the history of this country, in the history of our political party, first and foremost, the PDP, four regions, four geopolitical regions have had the opportunity of producing a president, a vice president, or a presidential candidate. Four. They are the Southwest, former President Olusha Gwambasanjo, the South South, former Vice President and then President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan, the Southeast has been, um, no, the uh, Northwest, former President Maria Ardwa, the Northeast produced Vice President Atuku Abaka and presidential candidates in 2019 general elections, right? Four. Only two parts, um, only two regions in this country have never produced a presidential candidate on the platform of our party. They're the North Central and the Southeast. Only one of these regions has never produced a vice presidential candidate, candidate or a presidential candidate on the platform of our party, the PDP. That's the North Central. Only one of these regions has never produced a vice presidential candidate all presidential candidates in the history of our country. The question is, if we're going to speak to zoning as um, a foundation for equity and justice, why shouldn't North Central produce a presidential candidate? Why shouldn't it? But that's not my, my core argument. My core argument is that in the face of the challenges that we face, that we have to overcome as a country, things that make you wonder, will we have a country by the next presidential election in 2027, zoning, the languages we speak, the part of the country you're from, the God, God you worship, cannot be the fundamentals for choosing who our next president should be. What, those, what that has to be is competence, is character. It's the ability to rebuild our economy. It's the ability to make our old people safe and to provide them health care. It's the ability to provide education for our young people. It's the ability to provide jobs for our young people. That's what the fundamentals should be. Now, am I saying that oh, this can only be found in the North? And no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, don't have, leave the conversation of zoning alone. Put competence, put people, no matter where they're from, put them there and measure. Should we choose this person or not choose this person on the basis of what he has shown us he can do over the past and what he's promising to do in the future. That's what I'm advocating. Final thing, final thing, final thing. I'm particularly committed to my principal's candidature. Because of that, while he was president of the Senate, he showed an ability to bring people to a table, to have a conversation about what we want to put into the country and what we want to get out of it. He showed the ability, the skill, the dexterity to be able to do that, in spite of significant odds. Hmm. In 2023, post-2023, we're going to need a, a president. We need a president that can help us rebuild our commitment to Nigeria, that can help us midwife a conversation about what are we putting into the country and what are we getting out of it, okay. that can help us have that conversation about a commitment to in Nigeria of our dreams that doesn't exist at the moment. Okay, interesting. I just want to backpedal a bit because you made a lot of points and I want to take you on 
on, on some. You talked about the fact that he's done a lot, he's built, you know, a certain persona that, in fact, you have painted a picture of him as the kind of person that we need. But then you pointed out the issues that we're facing as a country today, and you're saying that that's not the Nigeria that we want. Yes. But he's been the Senate president. He has been. He has also been a governor. He's been in government for a while. What did he do to prevent those odds that we're facing today, the issues of ethnic um, divisions? The reason why we have these non-state actors uh, and these secessionists that you have made mention of <laughs> is because of a lapse of judgment on the part of our leaders, being he being part of those leaders. And so sitting down there and having this conversation also shows that your principle must have somewhat been complicit and played a part in the, the problems that we're facing today. Or am I wrong? <laughs> I think you're wrong. Okay. I, categorically, I think. Go ahead and explain. When you want to start, in his time as um, um, senior ad, um, advisor to President Olusha Obasanjo on budget, let me start from there, which is the youngest position he ever held in government. As senior advisor, a special advisor to President Olusha Obasanjo on budget, he set out the framework for the passing of the Fiscal Responsibilities Act, which is supposed to be an act that guides our budgeting process. is the law, is the regulation that we use, the primary regulation for our budgeting process to this day. He did that in the year 2000. 22 years later, we still rely on the work that was done by a special advisor to a president. What we have there is well, the executive not always complying with the provisions of the Fiscal Responsibilities Act. I can move on. As governor of Park, <laughs> um, which example should I use? Um, is it the aviation school in Ilorin? Is it upgrade of infrastructure in Kwara State? Is it the, the um, redesign of what commercial farming should be? As president of the Senate, uh, no, before we go to president of the Senate, as senator representing Kwara Central Senatorial District, was he not the person who moved the motion that, um, who moved the motion for the investigation of the fuel subsidy regime, and thereby blowing open one of the biggest corruption scandals in this country that persists to this day? Was he not the person? Should I give you an example as president of the Senate? Let the Senate that has passed the most number of bills, that has treated the most number of motions, that stood between the, um, between the Buhari administration and the maladministration of Nigeria for at least four years. He's shown over the course of his character, um, of his career, the ability to take unpopular decisions, unpopular with Nigerian um, public, unpopular with his political parties, but which always, at all times, stand for the best interests of the Nigerian people. It's a simple thing. It's, there's a plethora of evidence over the course of his career that has shown his ability to push forward the sort of executive, the sort of legislative reforms that we require to run our country. Have those, have those, so, have those re reforms that you're making mention of, because it's one thing to say, oh, we've passed the most bills. How have those bills transformed the life of the average Nigerian or even the processes that lead to the transformation of the life of the average Nigerian? Because here we are having the same conversation. And, and you're, and you're pointing to stuff that he did, all fine and dandy. But how has it translated to bettering the lot of the average Nigerian in 2021? If this is some legacy that we need to example. point to. I can, I can give you one example. One of the biggest issues now that we've had to deal with, right, for the last two years has been police reform, right? One of the biggest How reformed is the police? That, that's a whole kettle of fish on its own. How reformed is the police? I want to we hear about these reforms on paper, but in reality, is the police no, in no. Nigeria really reformed? Can you, can you let me make the point? Please can do. you let me make the point? One, police brutality to deal with citizen institution relations that ensure that we will have a more responsive citizenry to the institution that we already distrust and do not like on account of police brutality. The National Assembly led to the death of the Eighth Assembly, did the very speedy passage of the Anti Torture Act to, to criminalize, to define what torture is, to criminalize it, and to punish it. Never done in our Nigerian history. The Eighth Assembly led the 
debate for the reform of the police act that hadn't been reformed for what 60 years that hadn't been amended for what 60 years president Buhari refused to sign the amendments to that act as a legislator he's done his job at all times what we must hold him to is his job has he done his job as a legislator that's two let me give you another example with infrastructure with health care as president of the senate he insisted that they must pass that that stipulation that constitutional provision that requires that one percent of the consolidated revenue fund is dedicated to healthcare. One percent of the consolidated revenue fund is dedicated year on year to healthcare, to primary healthcare. Now, if we did, if we fix primary healthcare, and there's a plethora of, of positions from the experts on this, that if we fix primary healthcare, we would reduce Nigeria's healthcare, systemic healthcare issue by almost half. It's not our fault if the executive refuses to implement it. As a legislator, he's done his job. Let's go to the economy. The, under, the Senate under him passed what? Must have been 11 bills that were all aimed at revamping our economy and making sure that critical sectors of our economy work, worked, that we're able to find the investment that we need to turn it over, that we're able to find the structures that we need to help hold our economy up make it easier to register companies, make it easier to get them, give more security to, give more security to investors. It's, as a legislator, it's not his fault if the executive refuses to sign those bills or if they do not implement after signing it, is it? Hmm. What we must do at all times is hold him responsible for the outcomes, for the job he does per time. And well i think i think that we're having connection issues uh mr nutra if you can hear me can you hear me can you hear me mr nutra because i think we we lost you for a second mr nutra can you hear me okay great go ahead yes we lost you for a second yes so I'm saying, I'm him responsible for the outcomes related to the job he's doing per time, and not for the failures of another arm of government. If anything, one thing that we must be grateful for is that under Dr. Bukola Saraki, the 8th Senate stood up to the failures of the Nigerian, of the executive. We must be grateful for that. I'll give you another example. Never before done. When every time they came, the executive came to the 8th Senate to say, give us an approval for a loan. He always said, the 8th Senate always said, show us how that money is going to be spent. Show us documents relating to that loan, evidence okay. for the application of that funding. Show us how we're going to repay that. Show us documents. Show us a plan from taking the debt to repaying the debt. Show us a plan. And on 11 occasions, the executive refused to do so. We're seeing the way loans are being approved willy-nilly on the same day that the application for the loan is coming. Right? Well, let me not go further in, in, okay. in, in, in being clear. I want us to move away from that and talk about, I mean, you continuously have harped on the person, which is great because you are trying to sell him as a brand or a person who's fit for that office. But then... Again, I want to go back to 2015, where a person was sold to us as a product, um, a no-nonsense uh, general. And, and they, we kept harping on the personality and their capabilities. Do you not think that Nigerians are a bit wary of these personalities and the products and the packaging and the, you know, the advertising that you, know, you political... Um, I don't know, handlers are selling to the average Nigerian person. Why would we, should we even be looking at these personalities anymore? Being that we put our trust in a person. And here we are. I mean, you and I can, can you know, attest to the fact that we're where we are, not because this is where we expect it to be. Why should we be certain that this other product that you're trying to sell to us, with due respect to the, Senate, um, the senator, um, why, do, why should we believe that this person will help us go where we want to go? Because, for a number of reasons. One, because we realize that no singular person can fix Nigeria. No. It will require to make our institutions work. 
it will require commitment from the Nigerian people. What we're saying is that let us elect a president that will allow our institutions work. Let us elect a president that will carry the Nigerian people along, that will communicate with them, that will listen to them. That's what we're saying. We're not saying Okola Sarki is an infallible person. No, we're saying that we want to believe in the in the ability of our institutions to function, of our country's um, social political structures to function. And we're saying, let's have a president that is that steps out of their way and allows them to do their jobs. Let's have a president that tells the country, these are my plans. This is what I plan to do. This is how I intend to do it. This is where I need your buy-in. This is where we'll get the money to do it. These are the outcomes by which to measure me. We don't want a president that shuts down conversation, that shuts down debate. We want a president that contributes to debate, that encourages debate, that listens, that listens even to the youngest of people. As long as you're good enough, you're old enough. That's what we want. And that's what we're saying that Dr. Bukola Saraki represents. In 2015, we had a president that made those promises, but that was very quick to break them. That was very quick to show that he did not, he wasn't committed to that. Even to the people who helped him become president, there was a lot of deception. There was a lot of double-facedness for a person who was only committed to becoming president to enjoy the perks of office okay. and the, the benefits that he brings. This is not what we're saying to people at this time. We're saying Nigeria will require rescuing. And I, as much as that, that has become one of those phrases that we hear repeatedly over the years, Nigeria does require rescuing. Okay. But it's not something that the president is going to come and do and wave a magic wand. It's something to which all of us have to be committed at all times. All right. Well, Ilomana Onoja is the senior special assistant to Dr. Bukola Saraki. And uh, we thank you so much for speaking with us. It was a pleasure talking to you, Marianne, and talking to Nigeria. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break. And now when we return, we'll be discussing the Equity State APC and its primaries, the outcome, of course, the inside troubles of the party. And, of course, we will be joined by our guest in just a minute. Stay with us.